Today's pod class is on tools. Before I get into the actual class, I'd like to answer a couple of questions. First of all, uh, there was a, a question about whether I'm going to be releasing my book called A Witch's Primer, which I've always used as my textbook in my class. Actually, at this point, we are not planning on doing that. Instead, this pod class is pretty much the audio version of my book. I decided to do it this way rather than trying to get it published because I felt that giving you a class, an audio pod class, better served the community as a whole rather than my trying to receive royalties. So there may be a time in which we do publish the book in the future, but at this point, we are doing it as audio pod classes. The good thing about this being on a pod class is you can keep coming back and listening to it over and over again. However, you may want to be taking some notes so that you can refer back to them yourself. And then the other question that I received is, am I still teaching regular classes anywhere? At this time, no. I've taught for many years and I've taught hundreds of classes and uh, at this point, I'm just doing it as a pod class, and then I'm doing my other podcast projects as well, uh, as running our websites and the uh, the forum. And that's all I really have time for right now. There's plenty of really good teachers out there, and uh, there may be a time in the future that I do uh, actually do do teaching again. So let's get into the uh, actual class now. We're going to be talking now about the tools of the witch. One of the first practical steps to take on the path will be the collecting and consecrating of your basic tools. The tools of a witch are very ancient symbols which aid us in unlocking centers of power that are deep within our minds. Although the tools are powerful in use, it's very important to really understand that in and of themselves, tools hold little value. They hold little power, but they do augment the power of the mind, as well as aiding us in training our mind. Conversely, the adept is able to produce remarkable results with absolutely no tools at all by simply using tools for enjoyment and pleasure rather than out of necessity. But as a beginner, it's usually very advantageous to uh, obtain and consecrate your tools properly. As a student of the craft, the tools are essential. Each tool is a physical representation of an invisible principle or aspect of your psyche. As such, tools assist you in gaining mastery of your life on all levels. This is known as becoming an adept. You don't need a lot of money to have a complete set of tools, nor do your tools need to be extravagantly crafted. Once you get started with the development of your craft, the wheels of magic are in motion and the juices get flowing. You'll be amazed at how you'll be able to manifest an abundance, abundance of high-quality magical equipment in no time at all, or anything else that you desire for that matter. Just start where you are and with what you can afford right now. There are some typical rules of etiquette for uh, being around other people's tools and other people's altars. You usually always want to ask another witch if you may touch her tools before doing so. Witches tend to build up personal energy around their tools and may not be able to feel comfortable if those energy fields are disrupted. When I was first starting out, I had to convert items around the house into magical implements due to financial restrictions. My first blade, or athame, was an old kitchen knife with a handle that I painted black. My first chalice was a wine goblet that I got from the kitchen cabinet of a friend with witch's runes painted upon it. A small stainless mixing bowl served as my first thurible, and I made my very first pentacle out of baker's clay, you know, the flour, salt, and water thing. Hopefully, you'll be able to afford to buy many of your items new, but if not, that's okay too. Whatever you use will work fine, as long as it's prepared properly. 
So let's begin to discuss now these tools and what they are, why and how they are used. Step-by-step instructions on how to consecrate each tool will be included at the end of each podcast as practical exercises. The first tool is one of the least tangible yet the most important of all your tools. This is called your witch's name. The name that you use now is the name that you've probably used all your life. All of the thoughts you've ever formed about yourself are wrapped up in this name, since the name represents who you think you are. It's very healthy and also very time-consuming to purge all the unwanted thoughts and feelings that you have about your, yourself and your name. Until you do this, however, your name may not feel like a very powerful magical word to you. Therefore, I suggest that you come up with a new magical name to use while working your magic. Choose a magical name that really reflects your powerful, free, healthy, happy, witch aspect. Many people choose the name of a favorite god or goddess, hero or heroine, or other powerful legendary character. Some people choose a name based on numerological calculations, and others choose a name based on just the way it sounds. There really are no real rules about coming up with a magical name other than choosing a name that feels right and good in your heart. The sound of your name should be a statement to you. It says, this is who I am, and this is what I'm doing as a, as a witch. I'm happy about it. Your magical name is not a device for running away from yourself or your past. It's an opportunity for you to take charge of your magical life. Your magical name is like a little button that you push in your consciousness every time you speak it that opens up the gate to your magical self. Some witches have two craft names, a public name and a private one. The public name is one that that is used at all the public circles and gathering in their community. The private name is one that they share with few, if any, people. A private craft name would be the link with the deepest parts of their minds and, and the gods. At this point, just choosing one name is sufficient, one that you use for yourself and when you interact with other people in the craft. Once you discover your name, just say out loud to the cosmos, I am, state your craft name, I am a beautiful, powerful witch and I deserve happiness and success on my path. The athame is the witch's blade. It's pronounced in different ways by different people. And it's called by different things. Some people call it the knife. Some people call it the blade. Some people say athame. A civil leak put an L in there and hers was the athelme. So <laughs> in my tradition, this blade re- corresponds to the element of fire. Other traditions say that it's the element of air. Don't worry about it. it. It doesn't matter. You don't need to get into arguments with people about this. There's There's going to be two different schools of thought on this until the end of the need for athames. So you just want to choose one and stick with it. So if you're going to study with a teacher from an airblade tradition, you need to really make sure that the that they give you the appropriate consecration because the consecration that I know and that's provided here is for a fire blade. The athame is widely used to direct your will and energy in magic. We use the athame to draw our magic circles, charge amulets, charge talismans, to sever unwanted ties, and so much more. The blade is one of the most important and often used tools. Traditionally, the athame is a double-edged steel blade from 5 to 6 inches in length with a black hilt. Steel is an excellent conductor of psychic energy, and the color black is symbolic of the power of absorption. Therefore, a black handle absorbs the energy of the witch and the power that the witch sends it through that handle. But then it focuses that that power into a sharp point out of the tip of the blade to its destination. If you feel drawn to a blade that's not of these traditional specifications, that's fine. Go for it. What's important is for you to feel good about your athame. Now, there's another two schools of thought regarding the athame. One says that people should only use their athame athame for energy work and never for any kind of cutting, scraping, or carving. People of this school often employ a second blade, which has been come to be known as a boline. 
The bowline is smaller, sharp, white-hilted knife used for ritual carving, scraping, etc. Some people even have it in a sickled shape. The second school of thought says that the athame is both used as an energy tool and as a cutting tool, and that using it will add potency to whatever it's used for, such as cutting or carving runes into candles, chopping herbs for spells, etc. So the choice of how you wish to employ your athame is completely up to you. Never, ever, however, use any of your tools disrespectfully. Always reserve them for ritual work, not for use in the mundane world. Next is the chalice, and the chalice, or the cup, represents the element of water. It is a feminine tool. It's representative of the womb of the goddess. The chalice is used for ritual libations. It's used for potions. It's often used for holding salt and water, used to purify a space before a circle is cast. Many of us have two chalices, one to hold the salt and water and the other one for drinking. Because if you're in the middle of a circle and you've used your chalice for salt and water and you don't have any way to rinse it out before you pour your ritual wine, it's not very pleasant to taste salty wine. The cup, as as I said before, is a symbol of the womb of creation. Caridwin's cauldron of regeneration, transformation, and wisdom, or even the holy grail of immortality. Your chalice can be of any material you like. Silver, copper, brass, gold, pewter, crystal, glass, ceramic, stone, you name it. Just make sure that if you use any kind of metallic chalice, that it's got the appropriate glaze or treatment inside, because these metals can be poisonous when mixed with wine. The next is called the thurible. And this tool is simply a large fireproof bowl with a thick layer of sand or earth at the bottom for insulation to prevent scorching of surfaces upon which it is placed. The thurible is also known as a censer or brazier, and it's used for burning incense, stoking up small contained fires. Use a small chafing dish, cauldron, casserole, incense burner, Although the thurible is associated with the element of fire, its main function in most ceremonies is for providing smoke, so we are going to attribute it primarily to the element of air, but secondarily to the element of fire. The pentacle is a symbol. It's a plate, and and, and there's a symbol on the pentacle of the five-pointed star. This is the symbol of the element of earth. It's any flat, round plate of natural material, wood, clay, metal, glass, anything, onto which is painted or carved a five-pointed star. The pentacle is used for consecrating items as well as charging and adding power to spells and candle rituals. The cord. As a practical tool, the cord is used for measuring and binding. Many traditions, mine included, use the cord as a system of degree or rank, just as the martial arts would use different colored belts to denote different degrees. All beginning students in my class start off with a one color cord. And if you are with a teacher, you need to find out if they have a color system if, or, and if they do, what it is. Otherwise, just simply weave your own favorite color or combination of colors into your cord. You can use any material that you like to make your cord. Rat tail cording from a fabric store works great, as does macrame cord. I find that yarn is a bit too flimsy for use in a magical cord. The wand. Now, the wand in my tradition is attributed to the element of fire, to the element of air, excuse me. The wand in my tradition is attributed to the element of air. Other traditions will attribute the wand to the element of fire. Again, the consecration that I'm providing is for an air wand. If you follow a tradition that has a fire wand, please seek the appropriate consecration from your teacher or from another book. The wand is a masculine tool like the athame. Whereas the blade is commanding and willful, the wand is compelling and thoughtful. A wand, for instance, is used during the invocation of deities or angels. It's extremely inappropriate to approach such a highly evolved beings, from my perspective, with a blade. The blade is the use is used for directing our own willpower. The wand is more compelling or for petitioning the will of a higher power. We need to discipline our will with the blade. 
Any unruly entities or powers that may show up are dealt with by using the blade. We use the blade for choreographing elemental energies in our circles. The wand, on the other hand, is reserved for devotions and prayers, invocations and petitions. Again, there are many different schools of thought on this, and some people don't see things my way. That's okay. These are just my ideas and what has worked for me and my students for many years. The traditional witch's wand is often a branch of willow, although any wood will do. Fruit woods are nice, such as hazel, almond, or apple. Go with your intuition. In addition to wood, a wand can be made from crystal or glass, crystal and gem inlays, metal. As a wand is an instrument of devotion, how it is made is a highly personal choice. The Book of Shadows is the next tool. This book, also known as sometime a, a grimoire or witch's workbook, traditionally has a black cover and parchment for paper. But a, lar a large hardbound sketchbook from an art supply store is perfect. Some people like to use a black three-ring binder so that they can mix and match and reorganize their, their work. The traditional Book of Shadows holds all of your spells and ceremonies, recipes, incantations. Most witches, myself included, have at least three separate books. The main Book of Shadows, which holds all of your favorite and most treasured material. Then they have a magical diary, which holds a record of each and every operation you've done and what you did, what result was obtained, etc. And then next, a recipe book or formulary of all your favorite incenses, oils, and potions. Many witches will keep a dream diary as well. How many books you keep is entirely up to you. Just make sure that you have at least your main book of shadows. All right, now in addition to these basic tools, which every witch usually has, you will eventually come across the need to gather maybe some other various witchcraft paraphernalia and apparatus. Uh, you might want a bell, a sweet-sounding chime to summon spirits, deities, angels, and punctuate different type parts of your rituals. Altar candles. Two white candles placed at the rear, right, and left corners of your altar. They provide reading light and represent the life force. God and goddess candles. Often candles are placed on the altar to be lit when the god and goddess are invoked. Most often a white candle is used to represent the god and a black one for the goddess. The goddess is usually on the left and the god is usually on the right. These are not hard and fast rules. They're just suggestions to get you started. Quarter candles. These are candles that are placed at the four cardinal points of your magical circle. Each would be representing the uh, color that corresponds to that direction. For instance, in my tradition, we use green for the north and earth, yellow for the east and air, red for the south and fire, and blue for the west or water. Okay, uh, an altar cloth. That's just the cloth that covers your altar. It's an important element in that it helps relate the other elements of the altar to one another. The altar cloth will be in a color that, or colors that express the theme of your ritual. For example, pastel colors for a spring equinox ritual or black for sewing. Oftentimes, most witches, for their normal everyday altar cloth, will use a black altar cloth so that, so that they can use any color that they want on their altar for other rituals with, uh, with their candles, etc. The broom or besom is used in a cleansing of space. It can be used to sweep away negativity or unwanted energy prior to other cleansing processes that take place when a circle is cast. Uh, some people actually ride their broomstick, and I know that sounds funny, <laughs> but it's true. And I've done this ceremony, and it's quite interesting. When you're practicing astral projection, you can grasp a hold of your broomstick, just like you were riding it, like a traditional witch, and you'd be laying down almost in a fetal position on top of your broom on the floor. And then as you ask to project, you imagine yourself riding on this broom and then you have a, an astral double of the broom as you're leaving your body and travel to wherever you're wanting to go. I know that sounds a little out there, but it is done and it is quite effective. Pen and ink of art. 
A quill pen and a pot of red magical ink is usually what's used. The ink traditionally has a drop or two of your own blood to burst, personalize the vibrations. Some people don't like this idea, so you don't have to do that. That's completely up to you. You could even use a lock of your hair or a drop of your own personal favorite perfume or essential oil if you would prefer. Incense charcoal. Remember that this is designed for use indoors. Do not use barbecue char charcoal that's used to barbecue meats and things like that in, in, in outdoor barbecues. It's extremely poisonous. This is special charcoal that you have to get from uh, either a Catholic supply store or, or metaphysical supplier. Salt. Now, sea salt, I feel, is best, although any salt will do in a pinch. Some people swear by kosher salt. Whatever salt you're drawn to is fine, but it's used for exorcisms, purifications, and to cleanse yourself and the area prior to casting magical circles. Parchment paper. Uh, you can usually get this at art supply stores or even office supply stores, used for uh, drawing talismans and petitions. And then your altar. Now, your altar can be permanently set up, or it can be a folding table or TV tray to be put away between uses. Altar cloths, as I said, are usually black as they represent the womb of the goddess, sometimes white to represent the life force. Altar candles, as I've said before, are placed on the back right and left corners. Those are usually white pillar type candles. And your working tools are placed on the surface of this table. Use your imagination if you have an altar that you, that you want to decorate. Remember that your altar is your own workstation. You can use statues, plants, flowers, anything you like. Be sure that all four elements, air, water, earth, and fire, are represented and balanced upon the altar. A robe. Usually the robe is black in color representing the protection of the womb of the goddess. It's not necessary for you to wear a black robe. Just if you do have a magical robe, the reason for it is remember that when you're putting on your robe, you're putting on your magical self, much like when you're speaking your magical name. Many witches prefer to work skyclad or nude, however. You may want to have a collection of acrylic paints comes in handy for painting runes if you choose on your tools of magic. Paint brushes, stencils, drawing paper, anything that you eventually need, you'll want to keep in one place so that you can find it easily. Now, if you're in a situation where other people know of your craft involvement, that's fine. You can do whatever you want. But if you need to keep your craft involvement private, then you want to make sure that you keep your tools in a safe place where people will not discover them. All of your basic magical tools should be consecrated before you use them. I provide written copies of each consecration ritual that I use on the forum at the dcw.999.org. This is completely free. All you have to do is go there and look under the uh, Ariel's podcasts section, then go to the witch's primer and each consecration will be in there. Before you go on to do anything else, listen to the next podcast and you can come back to this at any time you want. This is called grounding and centering and it's the first and most important exercise that you should become familiar with before doing any magic. Until next time, Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you got something of value out of this. If you have any questions, please feel free to go onto our discussion group. You can ask me or anybody else that's on there and we'll be happy to help you. As we say in the craft, merry part and blessed be. Mm -hmm.